This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, the podcast that introduces you to the rich world of storytellers who share their personal journeys, creative processes, and the stories behind their stories, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and I'm thrilled to be part of your writing journey. If you're an aspiring writer, a literary enthusiast, or simply someone who believes in the transformative power of words, you've come to the right place. Every week, we'll pop the cork on the world of successful storytellers and give you a healthy pour of inspiration, insight, and empowerment. My mission is to help writers like you realize your full potential through the transformative and therapeutic power of writing. Whether you're just starting your literary voyage or looking to refine your craft, I'm here to provide you with the knowledge, inspiration, and encouragement you need to embark on your own storytelling adventure. So, are you ready to uncork your story and let your creativity flow? Uncorking a story is about to begin. Sit back, relax, and let the transformative magic of storytelling whisk you away. Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Well, hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Uncorking a Story. I'm Mike Carlin, and I'm happy to have you with me as I uncork writer, actor, and author Don Futterman's story today. And I want to remind you to please follow Uncorking a Story on all social media platforms, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Hell, I'll throw TikTok in there as well. You can find us at all of those platforms at Uncorking a Story. And just a quick note on YouTube, that's a platform that's been a great growth vehicle for the show, and it's also become a very fun way for me to interact with the audience and, of course, for fans to interact with each other. So I encourage you to please subscribe to our Uncorking a Story YouTube channel by going to YouTube and searching for Uncorking a Story and hitting subscribe. For you audio listeners out there, please subscribe, rate, and review Uncorking a Story wherever you get your podcasts. Now, Don and I have a fascinating conversation today spurred by his latest novel, Adam Unrehearsed, which is really a coming-of-age story set in New York City in the 1970s. The lead character is Adam. That should be no surprise, given the title of the the story, uh, is in seventh grade. And the world around him is really changing uh, in many ways. And Don goes into a lot more detail with that. So uh, we'll we'll save uh, the synopsis for uh, for my conversation with Don. But it really got me to thinking about my own experiences in middle school. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you thought of who you were in middle school? It's not necessarily a pleasant exercise for me. Because middle school was not a period of my life that I would have characterized as uh, being great. It wasn't great. I, I felt like I didn't fit in anywhere. I wasn't a big big sports kid. I was shorter. And when I say shorter, you know, I wasn't a short kid, but I have a twin brother, and he's about three inches taller than me. So no matter how tall you are, when you're shorter than your twin brother, it's like a recipe for, for getting made fun of, um, which I did uh, a lot. Um, you know, I was an athletic kid, you know, I, I didn't have an athletic build. Um, you know, it was before I, I discovered my love of running, let's say. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why, why I was a target. Uh, I didn't have interest in anything I was learning either, which is a problem. Uh, it was kind of a recipe for unhappiness, but while I didn't have a lot of interests in academics back then, I, I was very much interested in stand-up comedy. And our seventh grade had a talent show when I was in seventh grade. We had a talent show. And my friend Chris, uh, God bless you, Chris Hart. You uh, encouraged me to do a two-man act with you (laughs) at our seventh grade talent show. It was really not just for the seventh grade. It was the whole school. But I was in seventh grade at the time. And we did this two-man act. And, you know, basically, let me just set the stage for you. 1986, 1987, can't remember the year, not important, but uh, important for Mets fans for 86. But um, man, we we come out to wait for it. Run DMC's UB Ellen. All right. So that could have been mistake number one, trying to be cool. Uh, never a good thing when you try hard to be cool. Also wearing white pants, white pants after Labor Day, white long pants, not shorts, long pants, no socks. We were doing our best to channel Don Johnson from Miami Vice. Mirrored sunglasses, mirrored sunglasses. We came out wearing mirrored sunglasses, T-shirts, white pants, no socks, run DMC UB Ellen. It was not a recipe for laughs. Um, I mean, a recipe for getting laughed at. 
Absolutely. Um, what's worse was the jokes weren't great. <laughs> the jokes were not great. Basically ripped out of the back of a, a Boy's Life magazine. Now, now we knew not to have them printed. We tried to remember them. Uh, another recipe for disaster. Because, uh, you know, the moment you get on stage, your seventh grade spotlight's hitting you. You're not remembering anything. So we we butchered all of our jokes. The only one I could possibly remember uh, went a little bit like this. Um, hey, Chris, what's green and flies over Germany? I don't know, Mike. What's green and flies over Germany? It's Nazis, Chris. I mean, that's the level of comedy that we were dealing with. Um, but we were in seventh grade. Give me a little bit of a break there. You got to give me a pass on that one. Terrible joke. Um but give me a pass. I was in seventh grade. I didn't know better. Anyway, we, we did not get any laughs. The only applause we got was when uh, the MC announced that the act was over and we were leaving the stage. And I vowed to myself I would never do something like that ever again. But um, cut to January of 2019, I decided to do an open mic at the Stress Factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Now, listen, at the time I said to myself, and this is where I believe silver linings come into play. I said to myself, I will never, ever do anything as embarrassing as that performance in seventh grade. In other words, nothing could ever be more embarrassing. So why not just give this a shot? So I did. I got three minutes. Uh, every comic that night on Wednesday, and I to say comic is um, probably an overstatement. Every aspiring comedic performer Got three minutes that night. My three minutes actually went by pretty fast. I did pretty well. I got some laughs and I learned about dopamine that night. Um, not a drug guy, by the way, but I learned that, uh, man, uh, making other people laugh, uh, making a group of strangers laugh in that kind of environment is a dopamine hit. And I, I chased it every Wednesday night <laughs> after that. And then I started doing uh, shows, not shows, but open mics at, at another place on Monday nights. So now my Mondays and Wednesdays were were pretty full. And then I got invited, you know, once I got my my sea legs or my comedy legs, I got invited to do a couple of paid shows. You know, we're talking 20 bucks here and there based on based on who sh showed up and and were willing to buy tickets. And um, then, you know, cut to October of that year, I got invited to open for a, uh, a sort of a regional headliner at our local theater here in Stanford, the Palace Theater. And, you know, I was in front of 200 people and I had 15 minutes and I, I did pretty well. You know, I wouldn't still wouldn't call myself a, uh, a professional comic. I have a day job, but um, it got me to the point where I was comfortable and, you know, really thinking on my feet and doing some crowd work. And I loved it. But I, I, I have to go back to to that one night in seventh grade. You know, of course, this this whole story was inspired by my conversation with Don Frutterman because his character was in seventh grade. And uh, I have to say thank you to Chris Hart for getting me back on stage in the 80s. Um, you know, that was a, uh, I guess, a turning point, even though I, I didn't really follow it up for uh, 30 years after that. But um, but it was uh, looking back, looking back, it was um, it was fun. And again, with that perspective of nothing could ever be that bad. Um, maybe that's the role. Maybe that's why that happened for me in life. I don't know. I don't know. So thank you, Chris Hart. I will not thank, I will not thank Greg Dowd or Wes Olson for what you made me do at Jorgensen Auditorium during homecoming of 1994 at the University of Connecticut as a member of the Kappa Sigma fraternity. Now, if listeners want to hear that story, you're going to have to request it. And maybe I'll tell it to you in one of these uh, upfronts one day. But today is not that day. So please remember, my goal with Uncorking a Story is to bring my listeners, authors who inspire them to become better writers. And I believe that Don Futterman certainly fits that bill. So without any more nonsense for me or walks down memory lane, here is my conversation with Don Futterman as we uncork his story. Writer and storyteller Don Futterman has written for a variety of publications, including the Daily Beast, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Aritz, Israel's newspaper of record. A graduate of Brown University, Futterman is a co-host of TLV1's The Promise podcast, has a performance podcast of moving and hysterically funny autobiographical monologues called Futterman's One Man Show, and has published two children's books. He joins me today on Uncorking a Story to chat about his life, career, and latest book, Adam Unrehearsed. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you here, Don. And I'm curious, where does your story as an author begin? Well, I've been writing my whole life. Uh, you know, I started writing when I was a kid. 
Uh, I wrote a story in elementary school uh, in which the butler did it. I was trying to, you know, use those expectations. But but really, it, it, it started later when I was working in a summer camp with high school kids. And uh, there was supposed to be a, a speaker after lunch talking to about 300 kids. And they didn't show up. And the uh, the director came over to me and said, can you do something? We got all these kids. <laughs> There's nobody here. So I got up and I just told them stories for an hour about uh, growing up and going to school and all the all the trouble that I got into and things that I did in school, practical jokes I played on teachers and on friends. And and they loved it. And they said, oh, can you do this every week? So it became a thing where I would like get up and just tell stories about my life and Eventually, I, I met a group of uh, professional storytellers who were doing storytelling, mostly for adults, uh, living in Cambridge, uh, uh, Massachusetts, and I was living nearby in, in uh, uh, Brighton. Uh, and uh, I, joined the, I, I joined this group called Storytellers in Concert, and we started doing basically storytelling performances, you know, one-person shows for, uh, for adult audiences. And I went back, at first I was doing uh, folk tales and myths, and then I went back to those autobiographical stories that I, that I first started with. So that's, that's where it, it really began. And I worked as a professional storyteller, and then I became a professional actor for about 15 years. Uh, and the writing, you know, I was the, the autobiographical stuff I was writing. Now, when I was storytelling, I wasn't memorizing the text, I was just kind of I knew the outlines and every time would be a little bit different. Uh, but then I started putting some of those things down on paper. And uh, and the, one of the podcasts you mentioned, Futterman's One Man Show, includes some of those stories that I told all the way back then and some new pieces, uh, you know, because I've lived a lot of life since then. So so I have some newer pieces about me and my father and about, uh, you know, other things that have happened since then. So writing a novel was sort of the, the culmination because I'd always been writing fiction and writing short stories uh, also, you know, when I was in college and later, um, but but it was mostly for performance. And then I said, you know, I, you know, performance has this amazing advantage that you're talking to an audience and you see the people and you feel the reaction and it's live and that's really thrilling. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, you, you can't go into that much depth because you'll lose people. You've got to keep things moving. It's got to go fast. Um, so I, I said, I want to try really writing a novel where I can go into more depth, where I can stay more in scene, where I can have longer exchanges and not worry that the audience is going to start to space out or look at their phones or their watches. So uh, so that kind of brought me back to writing a novel. So so this is kind of the culmination of storytelling from all different directions coming together in Adam Unrehearsed. Did you have did you feel like you came from a family of storytellers? And I'm, I'm just thinking about it, you know, you being sort of, you know, in, in you know, teaching or, or a counselor at this camp for high school kids and, and you, you know, having the, the sort of the um, I don't know, the guts to go up and, and start telling them stories from your life. Is, is that something that you grew up with? Did you grow up with a family of storytellers? Um, my mother liked to tell stories. So she was the big talker. My father was very quiet. He was a very quiet man. And my brother liked to talk a lot. So, so, so the two of them would tell, my mother particularly would tell a lot of stories. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that was also a way for me to actually get my voice, you know, where, where I could be, where I could be heard also <laughs> in the family and then among friends, you know, cause I used to entertain my friends with impressions of, uh, you know, sports announcers in New York city, Marv Albert, who I think is still around, um, yeah. you know, you know, 50 years ago, I was doing Marv Albert impressions, announcing Nick games and Ranger games. And, and sure. eventually that you know, morphed into telling them longer stories. And, you know, especially if if we had any crazy, crazy stuff we had done. Like I remember we in this camp when I was a kid, not when I was working there as a counselor, there was a, a, a sports equipment box, you know, the, the, and there were two camps actually next to each other and they were always in competition. So uh, we one night, uh, I, a friend of mine woke me up and said, come on. We're going to steal the sports box, which is the equipment for all the sports, you know, for 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 basketball, football, for baseball, tennis, everything they had in the camp. So we went over to the other camp about two in the morning. And uh, it was it was actually the, a stunt pulled by a bunch of the counselors. But uh, but they had asked my friend to come along and he woke me up to drag me along. The problem was my friend was a really big, strong guy and I was really skinny little guy. I was so weak. I could lift this sports box for about 10 seconds. You know that I had to put it down because the thing was so damn heavy. And we brought it back to our camp 
Uh, and along the way, we were meeting like counselors who were wandering around the camp at two or three in the morning. And, you know, certainly and we, and we bumped into a few couples uh, that were making out out there. And so I, at one point we saw some counselors coming for us. So my friend said, come here quickly. And he put his arms around me as if we were making out. And the counselors walked by and gave him a big <laughs> wink, you know, and that was and, 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 <laughs> and then they got they actually climbed up and put this box on top of the roof of the of the dining room for the whole camp which was very dangerous stunt. And in the morning, the camp director had all of us out there and pointed up and then said, we're going to find out who did this. And this is never going to happen again. And you're all going to be thrown out immediately. Nothing ever happened. But, uh, you know, so I can I confess up to that now. So, uh, you know, that that that's where it started. So, you know, so we had things we had done and things we could tell our stories. I told about my brother when we, when we were growing up together. He's, I have an older brother. And every night he used to hang his arm down next to the side of the bed. We had we slept in double decker beds, and he was on top because I was afraid of heights, so I wouldn't get I couldn't get up to the top. And uh, he would drop his arm down and make it shake, and then he would say, "This is your conscience." And, uh, <laughs> And I would say, no, no, it's not. It's you, man. He'd say, I am using your brother's voice so you could hear <laughs> me clearly. And then he would tell me to do things, you know, and I was like, I wasn't really sure. I wasn't good. So I did everything he told me to. So anyway, it goes yeah, way I, I, I always like to say one of the gifts my, my parents ever gave me was that of an older brother. Um, just, you know, because they they do play such a big role in uh, in your life, you know, making us the, the people who we are. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, that's interesting. And give us a perspective because, you know, you see all the stupid things they're doing and I saw, I'll see all the ways they get in trouble and go, okay, I better, I, I don't have to do that. <laughs> I can avoid that one. He told my parents everything and sometimes he would get punished for things he told them about. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be like a, you know, not tell them anything. I keep, I'll just be a closed bunker here. Um, and then they won't know what's going, what I'm, what I'm up to. So did you uh, did you grow up um, in, in the New York area? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up uh, in in Queens, in New York City. Um, and when I was a kid, we were in a in a big apartment building. Uh, we were near the top. We were the fifteenth floor, which is probably why I'm a little acrophobic, especially because my brother liked to hold me near the window and threaten to throw me out. But uh, he didn't ever do that, thankfully. Um, uh, and then we moved to the other end of Queens to a private house to a more residential neighborhood when I was about 12. So, uh, and Adam in the novel actually moves around that same age. That was drawing a little bit on my experience. Yeah. Well, that's probably a good segue to talk about Adam unrehearsed. So what, what can you share with us about, uh, your latest? Well, Adam unrehearsed is a coming of age novel about a boy, uh, in New York city in 1970. And, that was a really kind of dramatic time in America because it was, uh, you know, on the one hand, it was this super optimistic moment. We had just landed on the moon and we really thought we could do anything. And as a kid, I devoured science fiction books. I mean, I read everything Ray Bradbury wrote. He was still publishing then. So every new book that would come out, I would get and read immediately. And Robert Heinlein and James Blish. And I was sure that by the time I was my age today, I would be living on another planet. You know, because that seemed obviously where we were all headed. We were going to be exploring space and the universe. Um, you know, and also there had been all this progress in civil rights and, you know, seemed like we had... We were overcoming these problems. We were just starting to talk about environmental issues, though we were still calling it ecology at the time. Uh, but again, we thought, hey, we can solve all these problems. On the other hand, like the country was getting torn apart over Vietnam. Uh, there were there were riots. Uh, people you know, didn't think the civil rights movement was going fast enough. Uh, so, so there was actually a lot of conflict and, and dissent. So it was a it was a dramatic and maybe fraught time to be a kid. And I was experiencing most of this like everybody else on television. You know, we were just watching. There was this war going on across the world, which seemed very unreal, but really horrible. Uh, and there were all these things happening in, in the country and there were assassinations and there was a big teacher strike in New York City when I was 10 years old, which, you know, I experienced as a kid. We didn't have school for weeks and weeks. So I wasn't too upset about that. Um, and later I learned that that actually caused a lot of tensions between the Jewish community and the black community. But that was that was more from research than from remembering it as a kid. Um, so so that was that was a dramatic time. Uh, and I think uh, the, the Adam is a, is a Jewish kid in New York. And that was also a dramatic time in the American Jewish community, 
because the Six Day War had happened a few years ago, and American Jews are feeling very proud about Israel and how strong it was. And 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 I think my generation probably was the first that felt totally accepted. You know, we just felt completely American. We were just part of the society. We were we were just like everybody else. Uh, and and that was really different than our parents, and certainly from our grandparents who are immigrants who felt very much outsiders and, and we're still very worried about anti-Semitism. And I mean, unfortunately, today we're dealing with some of those issues kind of have morphed into a new way because of the, the massacre on October 7th and the war. But, but you know, that's, that was, th- those are also dramatic moments in the, in the Jewish community. But I, was, I went to public school. You know, my friends were everybody. You know, I, we had every ethnic group you could imagine. Uh, even in my building, it was a very mixed community uh, and we were all together. And, and I don't think we, we saw ourselves as partic- particularly different from each other. You know, we were just kids. And, you know, we, we had pickup football teams and pickup baseball teams. Uh, most of my gang was not really into formal Little League or any of that. We just did it on our own. And yeah. it, was, it was a different time. Like, you would leave the house when you got home from school. And our parents had no idea where we were. Like, they just, like, you had to be back by dinner time. And if I wasn't home on time, my mother would start calling my friends to see, if, you know, which one I was, house I was at and tell me to run home. But, you know, it's, it's not like today where if we're out of touch with our kids for 30 seconds, we're worried. Like, what happened to them? Why is your phone <laughs> off? You know? Where are you? Are you still alive? So that was so it was really different. And I think that was that was incredibly, uh, you know, empowering. We would just go yeah. off. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I my mother had a bell that she would ring and you would hear it in the neighborhood like and, and everyone would know, OK, it's a, the Carlin twins have to go home for dinner. You know, right. the football right. game's over. Are you, are you a twin? I'm a twin, and uh, and I had to one up my parents because I'm the father of triplets. So, oh my God, I, I'm the father of twins. I have twin boys. So oh, there you go. Like, How old are your boys? They're 26. 26. Okay, so yep. my, mine are about to turn 22. Um, oh, there you go. So, no, well, you got triplets. That's a, that's that's more intense. <laughs> that's you know, it's what's one more at that point? Not really. Hey. I mean, when 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 exactly. life is just spiraling out around you, like one more is just right. it adds a little bit more to the chaos, but. You're already knee deep in it. So. Yeah, totally, totally. But it's a lot of fun, though. So you're able to I mean, it sounds like you're 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 tapping into and I know a lot of us writers, you know, we do this. We tap into our own personal experiences, even in the fiction that we write. And, you know, we always yeah. sprinkle a little bit of our lives on on each of those pages. I have to ask about Adam just because you you mentioned growing up in Queens. Uh, is Adam a Mets fan? No, uh, ironically, Adam is a Yankee fan. And there's a very dramatic scene in the second chapter of the book that happens uh, at, on Bat Day at Yankee Stadium. I was a Yankee fan. I, you know, I think this is also part of the thing. I grew up in Queens, and I was a Yankee fan and a Giants fan. And of course, everybody around me were Met fans and Jet fans. And uh, back in those, and Shea Stadium was not very far from where I lived, which is where they were playing back in those days. And you could get tickets. You know, it was really cheap. You could get. We, I saw a lot of Jet games growing up because you couldn't get tickets to the Giant games. Like they were season passes that had been sold out for twenty years in advance. So, but something. I think it was because my brother, like right at the age when my sports allegiances were forming, my brother fell in love with Mickey Mantle, and the Mets. He, he's a little, a couple of years older than me, and the Mets were just starting, so they weren't really a thing yet. Uh, and so he. He kind of he kind of demanded or insisted that I be a Yankee fan. He basically stuck me in front of the television and said, "That's our team, you know, root for the." So I just did what he told me. And my father, who had been a New York Giants fan, but the Giants left New York and went to San Francisco in the fifties. So my father was kind of between teams. He hated the Yankees. I mean, he grew up in New York and he hated the Yankees. They were the evil. They were the evil empire. I don't think they used that term then, but but they did. He he he. he they were the they were the arch enemy, and he suddenly woke up, and both of his sons were Yankee fans. He was like, "Oh my God, how did that happen?" So, so we had this tension all, all through our childhood. Our dad was our, and, and when they, when the Mets got going, he became a rabid Mets fan, like super devoted to the Mets. So it was a, you know, the solution that he found one year was to take us to the Mayor's Trophy game, which was a uh, once a year the Mets and the Yankees would play each other. It was a game that didn't count. It was just an exhibition game, but it was in the middle of the season. And uh, the year that we went, uh, the, the, both teams played their starting teams because just for pride. You know, sometimes you put the backups and the backups to the backups because the game didn't count in the standings. But uh, that was before interleague play, way before interleague play. So, so that was a solution, and we we got to. The, I remember that the Mets won, so we were 
uh, we were a little disappointed, but my dad was happy. So at least, at least that. Right. Right. Yeah. It's always good to make dad happy sometimes. Right. Um, exactly. But I, my, my mother was, uh, she was born in Brooklyn. So she was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And my there father you know. was, uh, he grew up in New Rochelle. He and his brother used to take, I used to hear the story all the time, the Fordham bus to, uh, Yankee Stadium and go to the Yankee game. So they 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 became a marriage divided, but I think mom wound up winning because uh I went to a lot more Mets games and Yankees games as a, as a kid. Right. So. Well, so, well, so did I. Cuz that's where my father took us, you know. We, we went to Yankee games like every 5 years we'd go to a Yankee game, but uh mostly went to Mets games. Yeah. So what is there anything else to share about Adam? Uh, Adam unrehearsed before. Uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's also a book about friendship. It's about friendships forming. It's about friendships uh, falling apart for inexplicable reasons. It's about ostracism among kids. Uh, and Adam falls in love with acting. Um, he falls in love with uh, theater and his drama class in seventh grade. I mean, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but he he has some encounters with gangs. Uh, you know, some violent encounters with gangs. Uh, and he feels really overwhelmed in this big new school. It was it was a very large school that he's in. Uh, and he uh, the place he finds himself is on stage. So he, he's in a drama class and the, and the teacher really recognizes him. And that's kind of the first teacher that gives him any recognition in the school. And uh, and acting kind of becomes his his medium, his way to express himself. Now, so that's part of it. Also, look, you know, the book is a comedy, you know, and I think adolescence is an incredibly comic time, especially when you're not living through it, when you're looking back at it, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're trying to figure out the who you are, you're trying to figure out how you perform on stage and off stage, how you present yourself in the world. Uh, I mean, Adam is just beginning to notice girls. That's not really a big part of the story in this novel. It's, it, it's more friends and, and asserting himself. Um, at the same time, you're trying to figure out adults. You know, you're becoming more conscious that the adult world has its own rules. And Adam's trying to figure out his teachers. He's trying to figure out his parents, his older brother. All of them have very clear ideas of who Adam is and who Adam should be. And Adam's got to kind of figure out who he wants to be in the middle of all this. And, you know, people are pushing him and pulling him. I mean, it's he's in a very loving family. So in that sense, you know, he's he feels a lot of support uh, uh, and encouragement, uh, but also a lot of demands, you know, and demands that he be a perfect student. Uh, he's also in the year leading up to his bar mitzvah when he's 13. And so that becomes a central part of the story where he has this whole other world, uh, you know, in connected to his synagogue uh, and where they're preparing him for his bar mitzvah. And he has different mentors, his acting teacher and the, the cantor from the synagogue, who himself is an immigrant, uh, who is a survivor from Romania, who has a, such a totally different life experience than this kid who feels very secure growing up in, in Queens. Um, and uh, so he's, he's kind of torn between these different characters. And I think adolescence is a really funny time. You know, it's, it's, it's a funny time of life. Uh, and, and kids see things, and I tried to get into Adam's voice and his head. Uh, I mean, the story's told in the third person, not in the first person, because I wanted to be able to write uh, using the language I would use and not just the way a 12-year-old would talk or think. But but it's kind of very much from Adam's perspective for most uh, of the novel. And you see him trying to piece things together, trying to make sense of what's going on. Also, just some social dynamics with friends, which you can't figure out, like why it's happening or what's happening. Uh, and, and friendships that he makes that are completely unexpected with kids he thinks he would never have anything to do with, and they end up becoming close friends of his. Um, so he's, he's sort of discovering the world uh, and learning to be himself, um, trying to... Uh, find out what he wants to do. He's also becoming a little more politically aware, again, at the prodding of his older brother, who's 17, who's you know got to decide what to do because his brother might be drafted for Vietnam and what's it, what are they going to do if that happens? Uh, um, and, and also in the, in the Jewish community, which I would say that was the time when the Jewish community felt very secure for the first time, as I mentioned before, and, and even asserted itself kind of with its own cause, trying to free the Jews in Russia, who are not being allowed to leave the country uh, if they wanted to move to Israel or to America. They were, they were forced to stay there. Uh, so that became kind of a cause of the American Jewish community. And Adam's older brother gets very involved with that. And his brother is very militant 
And Adam's not really militant by nature. And his father is sort of super liberal and, you know, trying to keep things in perspective. So he's got tensions between the brother and the father and the mother somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, you know, they're all, they're all kind of muddling through. Uh, and so, so I think those tensions are also sources of great comedy, actually, because, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're conflicted and you're, as a kid, you see a part of the puzzle. I mean, we all only see a piece of the puzzle, but, but as a kid, you don't know what you're not seeing yet. You don't, you don't understand what all the other considerations are that adults have, whether those are your parents or your teachers or, uh, you know, other, other people who play significant roles in your life, what they want of you. So, so I tried to capture that, you know, that, that sense of it. And at the main time, he's also dealing with, uh, you know, feeling threatened by gangs and, by, you know, just sort of surviving, trying to get through every day, uh, which is something that in elementary school was never an issue for him. And suddenly it's like uh, school is a scary place and he's got to figure out how he, how he gets through it. Like there are different, the bathrooms in the school are controlled by different gangs and he doesn't belong to any of them. So he's got to figure out how do you go to the bathroom? You know, he's got to find somebody to take as an escort to the right bathroom and, you know, don't take them to the wrong bathroom. Then you're really kind of out of trouble. Um, so, so just challenges like that, that he's, that, he's, that he's trying to figure out while he's also trying to be a good student and please everybody. And, and underneath it all, it's a comedy. And underneath it all, it's a comedy, right. So there's like all this stuff going on, but it's also, it's also a comedy. I mean, I, yeah, I think it's a comedy. I think it's, but I, I think it's just like I see life as sort of funny, tragic also, but funny as well. Um, and hopefully that comes through in the novel. Well, I mean, if, if we can't find the funny in life, you know, I missed all that's going on in the world, then we've lost, you know, it's like, that's the one thing we can hold on to is our perspective and, and, and finding some way to, uh, I mean, I hate to say it, to make lemons out of lemonade <laughs> or lemonade out of lemons, or I don't know what the expression is. It's too early in the I'm morning. Sure. Look, when I first started telling, like those stories I mentioned before, and I was telling kids what happened to me in school, some of that were things that I lived through them. They were, you know, terrible. But looking back, I could see the funny aspects of it. I could see, you know, our embarrassing moments. You know, that's, it, it's no fun to go through it, but when you look back at it, you can, you can say, hey, that's pretty comical. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's being able to adopt this perspective of, you know, all the things that happen in your life, are they happening to you or are they happening for you? And if you can look back and say, this happened for me and this is the lesson I've got out of that, it's it's just a much more positive way, I think, to to think about, you know, all those events that happened in your past. And and by doing so, like all that weight that you've been carrying around, weight, resentment, um, whatever the, the name is for it, you know, you, you you kind of shed it a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, and you also see the positives, you know, and some of the things that you go through that seem really hard at the time. I mean, th this cantor is really pushing. I mean, th this kid can't sing very well. And this cantor is pushing him to sing more and more and bigger and take on one more, ch you know, and it's just, it's like the cantor has got his own agenda. He's got his own needs and he's got to turn this kid into a star and he's not very well equipped for it. But, you know, but he, but he wants, he, he's growing to love this guy. They have a really warm relationship um, and they play, they play sock hockey together. The camera takes off his socks and they use it as a puck and they play, you know, hockey uh, or really soccer, but they call it sock hockey. And so he wants to please this guy. And at the same time, he goes home crying from every session because he's a terrible singer. You know, <laughs> he's trying to do it. He's trying to find, you know, what he's able to do because he, and, you know, he, he rises to the occasion uh, as, as best he can. But, you know, looking back, I, you know, I went through something like that and it was hard. But looking back, I'm really glad I did it. You know, I, I gained a lot of confidence from that. Yeah, I love the notion that he's sort of, you know, in middle school, right? I think you mentioned seventh yes. grade, yes. you yes. know, which is a really tough time. I mean, think about all the, the you know, the, the social changes that are happening, like in your peer groups. Because I remember my friend group going from grammar school to middle school was different. And then it was completely different in high school. Like the kids I was right. friends with in middle school, we weren't all that close in high school and we all went to the same schools. Um, but then the fact that he's like going into theater and performing, you know, it, at a time when most kids are like, Hey, you know, you don't want to stand out at all. Right. Because it's, right. it's those who stand out that sort of get in the, you know, the, 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 the line of sight of uh, bullies and stuff, but he's uh, finding a, a way for himself and, and um, you know, on the stage, I think is, uh, is pretty good. And I think it also probably sets his, Sets, sets them up for some laughs. No, yeah, look, and that's exactly the tension. 
because you want to blend in completely at that age, but you also want to stand out. And how do you do both at the same time? You know, I think that's that's also the source of the comedy. So so he's he is completely terrified about how the how uh, some of the classes are going to react when they see the show that he's putting on in school. Uh, and surprisingly, the kids he's most scared of are the ones who love the show the most. You know, so he finds like the, the theater turns out to be a way to connect to people that he completely didn't anticipate. You know, and he he even gets warned in the in the novel by one of the teachers is those kids are going to eat you for lunch. You know, so just <laughs> it's even more terrifying. But then they're like the best audience. So it's like, whoa. Uh, and that not only allows him to connect to them in a different way, but it changes his attitudes towards those kids. He goes, oh, those kids can't be what I thought they were because they understood the play. In fact, they seem to have understand it, understood it better than my friends did. You know, <laughs> so, so, so it kind of reorients the world for him. And part of that is, you know, you, you, ha- you, you discover that you're operating on all kinds of assumptions and then they get overturned. So you discover the world's different than the way you thought it was. Yeah. Uh, I am curious. I know you, you grew up in New York. You also mentioned, uh, you know, Brookline, uh, spending some time there. When did you move to Israel? I moved to Israel in 1994. So I've been here almost 30 years. Um, I came, I, I had a connection to it from growing up. Uh, my family came here on a trip when I was 11. Uh, and, and that was sort of the first taste. And then I got into a Zionist youth movement when I was in high school, uh, outside of high school. So I put a lot of energy into that. And I kind of went back and forth a lot. And, you know, this is how things happen. Like right when I finally decided, okay, this is not for me. I'm not going to live there. Uh, that's what I met my, the woman who became my wife and she was Israeli. <laughs> and We met in America. We actually met doing theater. She was, I was, I was running a theater program in a, in a camp and she was doing the arts and crafts. So she was in, responsible for building all the sets and the costumes. So we were working together like 14 hours a day. And, and by the end, camp is a very romantic place and off in the mountains on the Delaware River. Uh, uh, you know, but we, we got together and, uh, and, you know, she was, she had been doing her master's degree in San Francisco. Uh, and when she finished, she was like, I'm going home. So, uh, so she took me with her. So, so in the end, I had my own inclinations, but, uh, uh, you know, it was very comical the way it, the way it ended up actually happening. Yeah. And I noticed uh, a beautiful bookshelf right behind you. Um, yeah. And, uh, I have to ask, are those books and CDs behind you? Yeah, we still have <laughs> we still have our CDs. We haven't played any in I think five years, but we haven't had the courage to just finally put them away or throw them out because <laughs> it's like I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I, you know, we, I just found a a um a box of records like you know forty fives and what seventy eights that yeah. my uh, mother in law my mother in law had. Um, you know, I'm we're talking thirties, forties, and wow. um. Wow. You know, put on a little Glenn Miller on my daughter's uh, USB record player, and uh, <laughs> uh, nothing like that sound, though. I mean, I think, yeah, and, yeah. and I have a box of CDs that I can't bring myself to throw away either. So yes, yeah, yeah. Well, you can see we're in the same boat. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, Don, where can people find out more about you if they want to learn more about Don Futterman? Uh Well, you can go to uh, I have a website, uh, donfutterman dot com, which is mostly about the novel, about Adam and rehearsed, and links to some other uh, pieces or interviews, uh, articles about the about the novel, including one piece about how you make the perfect hot dog. Um, and uh, you can also go to my uh, podcast, Futterman's One Man Show. So those are uh, right now. There's six episodes up of autobiographical pieces that are that are mostly very funny, uh, and there's there's a couple more that are uh, on the way. So hopefully it'll be up in the next month or two. Uh, and I also am on a, a, a podcast about politics and society in Israel, very different topics, uh, called the Promise Podcast. Although at the end of it, we also each do like a little personal essay. So I have these little personal essays. If you make it all the way to the end, or you can just skip all the way to the end. And you hear my little personal essays in a section called What a Country, uh, where we, we talk about what it's like living in this crazy country that we're in, in Israel. Um, uh, so, and I'm on there every couple, every uh, about once a month at this point, but I was on uh, for many years as one of the co-hosts. Uh, and, uh, you know, Otherwise, you can Google me, but I think that's more than enough. Anyway, people can find more more than they want to know on those on those sites. 
Well, we'll put all of those links in our show notes so people can easily uh, find you. You know, you mentioned what a country that brings me right back to the 1980s. Uh, do you remember Yakov Smirnov? Yes, of course. He was, you say, America, what a country. Yeah. And he would always yeah. have some witty observation after that. It always, right. he always made me laugh. Right. It's a, it's a similar idea. It's kind of like little anecdotes of things that happened to us. And also because, you know, the politics here are so heavy and right now disastrous. But we're, you know, so we're, we're talking about a lot of very serious things. So we try to do something that's a little bit more positive at the end. You know, say, you know, people are, despite it all, whatever you're watching in the headlines, daily life is going on. So, uh, you know, we, we talk about that and, and stuff that we're going through. And then Dan, last question would be, where can people buy Adam Unrehearsed? Uh, you can get it on Amazon uh, or Barnes and Nobles or bookshop.org or wherever you buy your books. Or uh, if you go into your bookstore and ask them to order it, even better, you know, they'll get some copies <laughs> into the store. Uh, I think that's, the, that's the, the, the most uh, likely way to actually get, get copies. But, uh, you know, you can get it in the, the hard copy or the hardcover or, or the ebook uh, on any of those platforms. Very good. Well, Don, thank you so much for stopping by and corking a story and letting me uncork yours. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.